Thank you all very much for coming this evening. This is the um, third in a series of lectures organised by um, our speaker, Stefan Freeman, here on Staying Safe Online. Uh, my name is Amber Mirror. I'm one of the assistant directors for IT services here at LSE, and I'll be chairing the lecture. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Dr. Steve Marsh, who has um, the wonderful title of Di Deputy Director of the Office of Cyber Security and Information Assurance at the Cabinet Office. Steve is also Director of Get Safe Online, which is a UK government initiative designed to provide advice to computer users. And he must be pretty good at it because I spent about 20 minutes this afternoon trying to dig up information on, on him on the internet. And I'm sad to say I couldn't really find anything very interesting at all. <laughs> um, Steve has over 20 years experience in security and IT in the public sector. And he was the winner of the European Information Security Award 2005 for excellence in the field of policy. Steve is going to be talking to us tonight about the role of government in staying safe online, so it's over to Steve. Thanks very much. Um, I thought I'd just stand up, if you don't mind, it doesn't destroy the camera too much. It's, um, it's an interesting time to be uh, able to say that you work in cyber security. Um, you may have seen some of the announcements earlier this week, and I'll talk about those in a minute, but... Really, let's just uh, remind ourselves why cyberspace is important. Um, we now reckon that 30 million people in the UK get online uh, almost every day. Uh, it's, it's a key element of, of us, our social lives as well as our, our business lives. Uh, in just August of this year, we had um, 4.4 billion pounds of online shopping, becoming a major uh, way of bucking the trend, if you like, the, 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 the recession over the last couple of years. And of course, in, in government, um, out of the 1.8 million contacts, or 1.8 billion contacts that we have with the public every year, we have over 20% of those uh, are currently online already. And what we'd like to do is try to get everybody online, get all the government contacts online as well. And there have been estimates that that would save possibly another 20 billion pounds if we could do that. So cyberspace is increasingly important. It un underpins not just the social and business lives, but it's an integral part of our critical infrastructure. Uh, it's under, uh, underpinning a lot of business interactions. And really, uh, as we find people talking about already, it's becoming um, the uh, almost a right of act to have access to the cyberspace <coughs> and the internet. Of course, they're the good things and the good things that we want to promote, but uh, they're also growing problems. Um, you may have heard uh, about the problems of cyberbullying. I certainly hope you haven't experienced any of those yourself. Um, privacy infringements, uh, I'm glad that you couldn't find much about me on the internet. I'm honestly um, doing, it, uh, doing it properly. Uh, but with something like Facebook, I mean, we're seeing again that, that Facebook has been in the news just in the last week or so because uh, it begins to uh, intrude on people's privacy in a way that the users are not happy with. And I think you're, Stefan will be talking about that a bit later on. E-crime is a growing problem. We reckon that, uh, although it's very difficult to measure accurately, there's at least three billion pounds worth annually of e-crime uh, damage to the UK. There have been estimates from ENISA, the European Network Information Security Agency, of a global damage of something like a trillion pounds. As well as e-crime, though, we're seeing increasing amounts of intellectual asset theft, not just intellectual property, but information from businesses about the contract negotiations they're going into, the bidding process, and so on. And we reckon that that's probably costing another three to four billion pounds to the UK economy. And these things are rising quickly. If, if that's all it was, you might say, well, okay, we can live with that because of the benefits. But these things are increasing rapidly and uh, getting to be a very serious problem. You may have seen reported earlier on that uh, attacks on HMG are, are, are very serious. Uh, we reckon now that we're getting a thousand targeted emails a month uh, against people working for the government. We have distributed now of service attacks against government websites. And of course, we've also seen recently 
uh, beginning to get attacks on, on critical infrastructure. You've probably read about a thing called Stuxnet that uh, Iran particularly suffered from, but then other countries as well. So against that background, um, it's not surprising perhaps that government is uh, getting seriously concerned about this and beginning to um, take more action than it has done in the past. So on Monday, the Foreign Secretary uh, announced the National Security Strategy in Parliament, and that identified four what were described as Tier 1 risks that uh, we needed to address. Not surprisingly, international terrorism was there, international mil military crisis was there, major accidents or natural hazards, including things like pan pandemic flu, was there. But the fourth one was, was new, and it was cyber attacks. Cyber attacks there meaning everything from uh, attacks on, on individuals through to government or defence or critical infrastructure attacks. Then on Tuesday, the Prime Minister uh, in Parliament launched the uh, strategic defence and security <coughs> regime. And that uh, described that there will be a, a new national cyber security programme. And this is going to attract £650 million worth of new investment over the uh, comprehensive spending review period, the next four years. And of course that's, that's new investment, it's on top of the existing uh, investment that government already puts into protecting its own uh, information systems. Now we've uh, looked at that generally, of course it's always hard to say exactly how much you're spending on information security, but we reckon the cross, average across the public sector, uh, we spend something like 4% of the total ICT budget on information security. That's about average for, uh, for businesses. Um, clearly, if you're in a high-risk organization, it's more. If you're in a low-risk one, it could be less. But that's 4% of the public sector IT spending, which is something like 16 billion a year. So that's another six or 700 million a year that we're already spending on information security. And that new money is against a background which I'm sure you've heard about, the Comprehensive Spending Review, where we're talking about potentially 490,000 public sector jobs to go, uh, and an average of 19% cut across departments. So the fact that, that that money has been allocated by the government to this topic against that background of the string of fiscal circumstances, I think gives an indication of how seriously government has been to take these, these issues. Now, the national programme covers a range of, of things, so I'll just very quickly run through those. Um, the first thing is, is trying to overhaul the UK's approach to cybercrime. The, the, the Home Office will be putting out uh, a new cybercrime strategy, uh, probably later this year or next year. And amongst other things, we'll be talking about getting a, a single reporting point for cybercrime. That's something which has been uh, missing or difficult to achieve in the, in the past. And that's actually caused, of course, caused the problem because if we don't have a proper reporting of the crime, it's very hard to tell how serious those, uh, those issues are. We also need to address some deficiencies in the ability to detect and, and defend against attacks. Uh, these attacks are getting very sophisticated. Um, they're attacking, if you like, not just government systems, but actually your systems when you interact with government or when you interact with banks. Uh, we need to really do more to protect the whole transaction end to end. And that will also include enhancing our investment in, in some of the intelligence capabilities which we need to develop to uh, really try to counter some of these cyber, cyber attacks. In the defence side, there's going to be a new defence operations cyber group and the idea there is to push the whole concept of cyberspace and cyber security much more broadly across the whole of the defence establishment. We need to look at some aspects of critical infrastructure and try to uh, repair some of the deficiencies there. Um, it's clearly very difficult for companies that are uh, purely commercial, they're operating um, what we describe as crit critical infrastructure services on a commercial basis, but actually the decisions that they take have a major impact on national, uh, national security and national risks. We're going to be sponsoring some uh, more research in cybersecurity, 
and introducing programmes with cybersecurity education skills. We are certainly going to develop international alliances further. Again, this is not something the government can do on, it, on its own. It has to work closely with private sector partners, but also with international partners. And in particular, we want to draw all this together again and uh, put it out as a new cybersecurity strategy. Um, the first cybersecurity strategy was published last year under the previous administration, and that actually led to the setting up of the Office of Cybersecurity. Um, but we now need to take that forward with fresh that and really describe the progress that we have made and that we will be making uh, over the coming years. So what does all this mean for you and I as individuals? Well, in the same way um, that in physical space, if you like, just because we have a police force or a navy, uh, doesn't mean that as individuals we can absolve ourselves of responsibility for, for taking due care. Uh, just as we need to lock our doors and the houses, lock our windows up when we go out, uh, avoid dark spaces, we've got to uh, take, take our own responsibility, contribute to the safety of cyberspace as a whole. Now I saw on the, on the way in that uh, LSE has produced some very nice uh, top tips for protecting yourself. I, I just had a few that I thought I'd run through myself. And the first one is, if it looks too good to be true, it is. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, people are on the internet, uh, companies are providing services often to uh, make a commercial, um, uh, commercial business. So Facebook, for example, uh, runs into some of these privacy problems because it's there uh, to make money. It doesn't, it's not a bad thing, but you have to remember that a lot of the activity on the internet is there because people are trying to make some value out of perhaps the information you're supplying. Um, so you just need to, to bear that in mind when you're uh, giving out personal information. When you're putting information onto the internet, on Facebook or, or, or others, just stop and think, is this something I really would like a future employer to, to, to know about? Um, I remember two or three years ago there was a but we at Oxford University because the uh, university authorities had said you mustn't have these um, excessive uh, <coughs> celebrations after examinations. Um, of course, people went out and had the excessive celebrations anyway, published the photos on, the, uh, on, on their Facebook pages, but were then outraged because the university proctors had already gone on, had already gone onto the Facebook pages, seen the photos there, and were then disciplining the, uh, the undergraduates who'd done that. I've heard stories of people uh, on some of the social network sites with 2,000 friends. Um, I, I, I'd like to be that popular, really. Are, are all those friends really who they say they are? Are they really people that you want to be sharing some of your private information with? You certainly need to keep your soft, software up to date. Um, there's a lot of uh, vulnerabilities being discovered all the time. Do Make the take the advantage that of, of uh, up downloads that will uh, patch the software and, and make sure that the vulnerabilities are being patched as soon as you can. And then finally, so if you if you can try to partition your lives, it, it's it's possible, of course, in uh, on, on computers now to log in as different people if you like. You can have one account where you're playing online games. You might have a completely separate account where you're doing banking. And just that slight partitioning can, can make a, a difference. But there are just a few, and, and clearly you've got much more um, advice on, on those leaflets. And if you want to get some more information, I, I would recommend Get Safe Online. We've heard that, uh, about that already. There's a website, www.getsafeonline.org. And um, in, a couple, uh, in about a month's time, just under a month, we commence on 15th November. It's going to be Daniel Get Safe Online Week, so there'll be a range of activities around that that will promote uh, on, online safety. It's actually a, a joint initiative between government and the private sector. We've had a lot of support from uh, the private sector over the years. Uh, we're going to be putting more investment into that from the government side in, in the coming years as well. The idea is that it's, it's free advice, it's independent advice, and it's uh, user-friendly 
simple, simple tips to, to help yourself. And then the final thing uh, that I was just going to mention before handing over is also um, something called the Cyber Security Challenge. If you're feeling uh, more confident in your own skills on um, computer security, you might want to take part in uh, what's a series of national online games and competitions that test your own uh, cyber security skills, either, either as individuals or in teams. Um, we're encouraging people to uh, get, get involved in this. Uh, there, there are prizes involved and, and so on. It's something that we're uh, started up this, this year. Again, a uh, public-private sector partnership. Uh, it's been running for a year or two in the US. It's been very successful, except, of course, the last, I think it was last year, uh, the person who won it did the um, Captain Kirk from Star Trek version of actually going into the computer that was hogging the marks and adjusting his own score. <laughs> but I wouldn't suggest you do that um, in this case. So that was just a very quick overview of cybersecurity, and I'll hand over to Stephanie for the second half. Okay, thank you very much. Before I hand over to Stefan, do we have any questions for Steve? My question is that there's been much talk of um, rules of engagement. Uh, so how will that actually work in cyberspace given that identifying exactly who you're engaging with is not an exact science. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you're quite right. Attribution is a, a very difficult problem um, in cyberspace. And really, when people are talking about rules of engagement, it's in a, in a very limited context, because you're quite right. You know, until you are extremely sure who it is who's attacking you, and actually, have you got their machine, if you like, that, that's doing the attacking rather than foxes somewhere. You can co cause much more damage, collateral damage, by just attacking back, if you like, than, than uh, uh, that would just be justified. So, really, when people talk about wars of engagement, I think it's in quite a, a, a narrow sort of warfare context. And really, that is... I think you would say it was the sort of last resort almost. I mean, just because somebody's attacking you in cyberspace, um, it doesn't mean you have to respond in cyberspace. You know, if it's a, if it's a state, you might take diplomatic measures. Um, you might, if it's, a, if it's criminal, you would want to pursue them through normal legal processes. So really, um, although, you know, it's, an ex it's a sort of, from a geeky point of view, it's an exciting thing to talk about hacking back, actually, uh, it's not something that's going to be at all at all common, unless people really have a very serious attack and they've um, very accurately determined where it's coming from. Um, when you speak of, of your intention to try and um, set up a central reporting point for cyber attacks or cyber crime, the sufferers of any sort of cyber problems. Um, I just wonder, uh, the, one of the speakers last night was uh, in charge of the Metropolitan Police yes. uh, Cyber Crime Team. Yes. She said she only had 40 staff. She couldn't even attempt to uh, deal with one in a thousand yes. of the reported crimes so far that are being reported daily. And um, she didn't even know how much of the increased uh, expenditure announced in the spending review uh, was going to go to her. So can you explain why um, you think that a central reporting point is going to have any benefit? The, well, the, the problem we have at the moment is that because there isn't a, a, a central reporting point, it's hard to um, assess whether individual attacks, if you like, are part of a, 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 a very large organised criminal activity or are just sort of individual attacks. Now you're quite right at the moment, the scale of the attacks that are going on uh, it completely swamps the, the police resources we've got and one of the things that we need to do uh, 
and it will take a long time, is to, to build more skills in, in, in the police forces generally to uh, address that. But what we're going to have to do, clearly, is, is to be very um, targeted against the, the large-scale attacks where uh, serious organised crime is really getting, um, uh, getting involved in a big way. But you can only do that if you, if you can start pulling together a picture of all the related attacks. So, you know, they're going to be geographically distributed, um, so it's not something you could necessarily spot in a particular police force geographical area. But if we can start um, bringing that all together, you know, you're quite right that the, the chances of investigating all of those are very slim. But if you can pull them together and say, right, actually all of these, you know, this 100,000 attacks, are actually all being perpetrated by the same gang, for example, then uh, you know, Charlie and Bernie can have a go at that. And it, it will be un... Uh, you know, it'd be difficult for the people who are suffering these these attacks and are reporting them and thinking, well, that actually nothing's happening. But we will be able to start addressing the large scale crimes. Yeah. Well, I mean, she, uh, you know, even with the current uh, situation, I mean, there are a lot clearly a lot of attacks that we're not addressing. But as Charlie probably told you yesterday, I mean, there are successes in arresting people just, just a few weeks ago there was quite a large gang both in the UK and US that was well up so there is there is progress but we've got a long way to go Thank you. Hi, um, my question is about uh, the work that you do at OCS um, you mentioned the 650 million of new money that's mm -hmm. coming through from uh, the government to tackle cyber, cyber crime yes. right, and cyber security and I was wondering if OCS or the cabinet office more generally had had any thoughts about whether uh, how that 650 million is going to be deployed, whether it's going to sort of be distributed between departments, or whether it's going to be sort of a central fund, because as departments move towards shared services, I think their uh, cyber security and their their own systems is, is still quite siloed. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how to sort of uh, join those up. Uh, yes, sure. The, the the moment the precise. Um, mechanism for for running the program hasn't hasn't been um, tied tied down, but clearly the I, the idea is that we would have some sort of central uh, fund, if you like, and then and then that would be passed out to departments in accord with an overall national program that we will uh, have oversight of. Now, clearly, with with an OCS IA as, as we now are. Um, relatively small number of people, we won't be driving that program directly. Deliverables have to come from the different departments and agencies uh, that, that are pinned down from there, but uh, we will have the overall, overall oversight of that and they will be accountable uh, to uh, the, the program uh, owner uh, who will be in the cabinet office to, to, uh, for how they spend that money on their deliverables. Now, that, that's a whole range of, of things. I mean, some of it is about um, protecting government systems uh, and that's going to in some ways be easier to, to pull out of the silo because of the government's plans about shared services and so on where you begin to move to a more shared infrastructure um, but some of it is about uh, strengthening say the policy um, response in different departments uh, one of the uh, many complexities of, of cyber security is, is, is really the way it overlaps and reaches into so many different policy areas. So uh, we've recognised for um, a long time that we actually need to build capacity across other bits of government and some of the funding will be to go, to go into those departments to, to build the policy uh, strengths around, around cyber security as well. One more question. Thank you. Um, Yes, you, you, you um, mentioned briefly that um, you know, the, the, the attacks on, on infrastructure are really not um, So I really wanted to ask about, uh, are, are, are there different mindsets involved in protecting cyber security and also physical security? And the two seem to be coming together more. And um, is there some sort of like, hybrid training or how, 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 does, how, how, how do we approach that in the future? Because it's a new sort of thing. Yes, yes. Um, 
I, th I think there probably are, are different mindsets. I mean, physical security uh, clearly is, is, is geographically based, and part of the approach, I think, that people have taken in the past, both on, on security and, and resilience more generally against hazards as well as <coughs> malicious attacks, has, has been talking about sort of replication and, and geographical separation and so on. Now, of course, in cyberspace, if you're running the similar systems, it doesn't matter physically how far apart. If they're networked together, you've got the same system. Effectively, in cyberspace, they're in the same place. So, th so there is a mindset change, I think, there about how, um, sort of, what 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 does resilience and diversity mean in cyberspace as opposed to physical space? Uh, and it's, I think, the other thing which is going to require a change in mindset is that. Um, physical attacks, you know, they're very visceral. If you see a bomb go off somewhere, you, you know exactly what's happened. You know what, the, you can see what the damage is and so on. These uh, cyber attacks are, are, are much more abstract and often <coughs> sort of highly technical, and relating information about um, sort of arcane vulnerabilities to a business impact or a, a, an impact on individuals. It's actually quite a, a, a conceptual leap, if you like, and that, that's the, I think, a difficult area that people need to adjust to. Okay, well, thank you very much. We may have time to come back and ask Steve some more questions at the end, um, but for now, we're going to hand over to Stefan. Um, Stefan Freeman's the Information Security Manager here at LSE, where he's responsible for implementing information security. That's everything from creating policy to hands-on forensics and advice. He has, I'm told, spent his entire career in information <laughs> security. Um, he was previously the information security manager at London Underground. And uh, he has a, uh, another life as a secretary. He's secretary of both the Information Systems Security Association and also the Information Security Awareness Forum. Um, Stefan's going to talk to us about risk perceptions and what students in particular can do to uh, protect themselves and stay safe online. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you. I, I didn't know I was going to get such a um, complete biography. Um, I, I want to say thank you, first of all, to those people who did actually come to every uh, um, evening. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been actually very informative and the, and the speakers have been very, very good. And this is my opportunity to actually say something uh, rather than sitting at the front. Um, so, this works. the point about all of this is to raise awareness and get people thinking about um, what activities they're, take, they're doing online and maybe to modify those activities if they think that, uh, that they may be taking a risk too far. Um, it's not really supposed to terrify anyone, although um, though hopefully it will give you pause for thought of this. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I am intending to give you some uh, some points about where you can find some information over and above these wonderful leaflets that, that are very Jackson Pollocky um, that are freely available from the foyer as well as please take a mouse map. Uh, we've, we've had them for a while and we <laughs> sort of distribute them widely. Um, anyway, I'm going to start off with a, um, a quiz. Um, this is a uh, um, so for those of you who've seen this before, I apologise. I'm sure that you'll get it just as wrong this time as you did last time. <laughs> but fine. Um, this is the, uh, um, uh, a quiz to see whether anyone can guess the likelihood of dying in particularly odd ways. Um, so um, I challenge anyone to give me a, um, uh, a, uh, an idea of how likely it is you're going to die in an aircraft accident in any particular year. Had a guess. No one? One in 10 million, right? Okay, well, actually, it's one in 432,000. Um, I believe these are from 2005. Um, so, anyway, so um, being an occupant in a car. Yes? One in 50,000. One in 50,000? One in 19,000. It's not far off. Um, being hit by a car. I'm not sure it's the same accident, but. Um, no? One in 49,000, so you're more likely to die in a car than being hit by one. Um, hit by lightning, this is always a fun one. And I guess, I've got the answers here. Uh, <coughs> one in 500,000. No, it's one in 6.3 million. Okay. Drowning in a flood. 
obviously likely. Yeah, it's probably more likely if you live near, near, near a river than if you live on the top of the hill, but you know, average out. One in a million? One in 13 million. Okay, being electrocuted. Now, I'm redoing my house at the moment, and I'm probably slightly more <laughs> risk of this than others are, but... Yes? 10,000. One in 10,000? One in one million. So um, I think I, I probably will skew this. Um, being shot, bearing in mind this is actually in the States, so being shot. <laughs> <laughs> one in ten. <laughs> uh, one in 25,000. So you're actually more likely to be shot in America than be, um, um, be run over by a car, which is a little bit concerning. Um, Self-inflicted dying by shooting. I'm not sure whether that's by accident or deliberately, but... One in 40. One in 40,000, one in 17. So you're more likely to, be, to shoot yourself dead than be killed by someone else. Um, falling down the stairs. 15,000, okay. And lastly, alcohol. Obviously, you can, you can relate these things together. You could be drinking and driving and shooting yourself at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the PA was raised. One in eight hundred and twenty thousand. So um, the point about this is that we're all very bad at assessing how likely anything is actually going to happen. Um, so this is really to start off with talking about perceptions of things. Okay, and uh, and from talking to people, a lot of people have an interesting perception of the internet, okay? Um, this is how I think most people see the internet. It's where you physically are, you're sat in your home, glass of wine, you're typing away, you, you know, you think that, that everything is fine. Whereas I think it's more like this. You're actually in a park at night, you have a light, and there may be millions of people in the shadows, but you can't see them. You might meet with friends, but, you know, you don't know who else is there. So, um, this is a... Um, uh, Sort of just trying to put some scenery here as well. Um, I'm going to start talking about social networks. Um, is anyone here in the LSE network on Facebook? Yeah, a couple, right. Did you know there were 31,000 people in the LSE network? And if by default you don't change your security settings, they can see everything on your profile, even if you're not friends with them. So these are the little interesting things that, that, that crop up when you start looking more in detail about what's actually going on. Um, the last slide, it may, may seem a bit obvious, but I have had people come up to me saying, I think I'm being stalked because people who I don't know can see my tweets. And it's a real problem. Some people don't realise that Twitter is actually completely open by default. Um, anyway, so more on Facebook. Yeah, there are about 500 million people on, on Facebook. Um, I stole these from Get Safe Online. Uh, so, but uh, um, nearly half of people in 2007 didn't know there were privacy controls, and last year there were still 25% that didn't know there were privacy controls on Facebook. Um, but there is an awful lot of information available to help you um, actually tie your your account down. Um, these are the default settings on on Facebook, and you'll notice that. Status, photos, posts, biography, family and relationships are by default open to everybody. Um, yeah, and also friends of friends, if you think, I mean, you know, if you have 4,000 friends, um, you know, that'll probably equate to about 30 or 40,000 friends of friends, second degree of separation, who will have access to your photos and videos that tagged in religious and political views, um, and your birthday, which is also a, a, a very important um, piece of information from an identity theft perspective. So, what are the risks? Um, these are just a few. Um, uh, uh, you've got uh, malware, you know, you, you have people sending you um, um, messages via Facebook saying, please click on this link, and you go there and it infects the machine. Cyber, st uh, cyber bullying, um, stalking, or, or worse. I mean, I've, I've sadly been involved in a case where, where somebody had their account compromised because they're being um, extorted for um, um, but information actually, um, and it was an absolute nightmare to get their account back. Um, the drunken photos never go away, this is so true. Um, I've been told um, um, on occasion that, um, that, that people, large com companies, do gain access to people's Facebook accounts and find out what you really are like, especially if you're working for a company that wants to pay you uh, in excess of 50 to 80 thousand pounds a year. The first thing they'll do is see, you know. Um, if they can differentiate candidates by, by what their real opinions are. Um, I 
I've talked about extortion, um, friends in need. I've, I've, I've also had the, the, uh, the um, interesting conversation with somebody who I knew who said they were stuck in London, but they couldn't identify where, and they needed a couple of thousand dollars to get home to America, and yet they lived in Ricelip. So, um, you know, there are the, the, odd, the odd little um, 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 things do happen. Um, and identity theft, obviously. Uh, I'll come on to that a little bit more later. This was interesting. This was this week. This shows you um, exactly what happens in Facebook. And the whole the message here is don't ever put anything on there at all that you don't want people to find out. The Facebook privacy policy says nothing is private. It's about eight pages long. But in there, it actually says don't expect anything to stay private. Uh, and while they admit that this is a, a bit of a breach, the whole business model of their organization is to, to, is to effectively um, utilize the information that you give to the site in order to sell advertising and gain revenue. Um, so this wasn't a huge surprise, to be honest. Um, this is an interesting site. This is from the TUC. This is a, um, a um, site that tells you about the risks of putting things online that may affect future and current jobs. Um, it's uh, um, I think this came about after a, um, a, an employee of a large bookstore started uh, writing a blog about how how he wasn't very happy and uh, ended up getting the sack. Um, and and organisations are quite entitled to um, to take issue with things you say publicly about them. Um, these are some of the uh, the things that uh, um, uh, can happen if you if you, for example, change your status. Uh, I've heard of a number of issues where people have been attacked simply by changing their their relationship status from, from married to single, for example, without actually informing their other half. Um, so there's a, there's, there's a number of little um, um, risks around that. You've got to think about what the consequences are of what your actions are, even if, the, if you don't quite know immediately um, you know, what the impact is likely to be. So um, identity theft. A lot of people talk about identity theft, but not, not many people really know ways that, that um, it can affect people. Um, and I thought it would be quite useful just to explain what actually happens in a lot of cases. Um, what tends to happen is that people impersonate you to open a bank account, who then will go to the bank, withdraw a load of money, and then leave you with a trash credit rating. Uh, and uh, it's uh, um, interesting how often this happens. Um, I believe um, that this actually costs something in the region of £2.7 billion pounds a year to the UK economy. Of, uh, of um, lo effectively lost money that ends up being reimbursed. Um, there's a great website called Action Fraud, which um, um, provides an awful lot of information on this uh, and helps helps to, uh, to to raise awareness as well about the things that you may decide that you shouldn't be telling other people. Um, an interesting figure that actually for every single person in the country that works out to be 65 quid. So in the current climate, every penny counts. Um, Quite a little phrase. This is um, um, uh, the, uh, another website that provides uh, some uh, very useful information. I think it's an association with, um, with Get Safe Online. Um, I think this is identitytheft.org, if I remember rightly. Um, I think it's a place where you can find out how to stop your identity style rather than having your identity stolen, at least I hope. Um, so, some little tips. Um, you know, if you've got documents with bank statements and things, either shred them or, or keep them. Don't just dump them in the bin. Um, you can go on Experian and for free for 30 days check your credit rating, because every time a loan gets taken out in your name, it will appear on the Experian website. And so you can actually check to see if somebody has taken out a loan in your name that you don't know. Look for yourself in Google. It's amazing how many people don't do this. Just search for yourself. And just to see how much information is being leaked about you, um, and yeah, if you don't want it out there, don't put it anywhere. This is a, such an obvious thing, but if you don't want to have a picture of you, you know, doing something very dodgy while drunk on a Saturday night, then don't upload it in the first place. Even if you delete it, Facebook will still have a copy of it. Anyway, some other things that, that may have, uh, be of interest to uh, to you. Um, I'm going to talk about um, fake AV money mules, phishing scams, and uh, copyrighted material. This is fun. Um, even my dad got done for this. Um, he, uh, basically what it is, is a, it's a very, very novel business um, proposition. What they do is that uh, they hack a website, they say that your machine is infected with stuff, and if you click here, um, you can download some software to fix your current infection. Um, 
But when you actually get to the download, it says oh, you, you also have to pay $65 or so in order to, uh, to get this new antivirus, which will sort your machine out. Unfortunately, it's actually more malware. It's actually a virus itself. And so you're actually paying to infect your machine, which I think is very novel. Um, from my, again, from my understanding, I can't remember where the figures come from, but uh, I, when, they were being, when they were shut down, one of these organizations, I believe they're making $100,000 a month to some Bermudan bank account. Um, when, I, when I talk to undergraduates, I, I suggest this isn't a, an appropriate business model to pursue. Um, I think in the end it doesn't really work out. Uh, money mules, this is a, a, a topical one. Um, a, a student in Bath University actually got arrested for this. What, what happens here is that um, students attend, tend to be um, looking for ways to make a bit of extra cash. And um, some people take advantage of this by offering um, a quick and easy way of, of uh, um, allowing you to make a lot of money. And what they do is they say, right, we've got £10,000 and we need you to send £9,000 of that via a wire transfer service to someone in, a, or to borrow Rob's phrase, Ruritania, um, to... Uh, <laughs> Um, to, to basically send the money because we have no capability of doing that. And what's actually happening is you're laundering the money for them. And so while you may think you're getting a thousand pounds, you're actually liable for the full ten grand. And so what happened, and what happened to this poor, poor person in Bath, was that they were arrested and they were, they were made liable for all of this additional money that they'd been sort of processing for the for effectively a criminal gang. And it was just a money laundering exercise. Um, so, um, yes, Steve, you stole my, my first line. If it sounds too good to be true, it generally is. Um, it's um, basically, it will leave you out of pocket if you, if you, if you um, fall into this trap, but I'm sure you won't. Uh, phishing, my favourite one. Um, there are all sorts of different sorts of phishing attacks at the moment. Um, this is a, um, a copy of a bank's website that was scraped and was uh, regurgitated as a phishing site. Oh, you know, there, there are... There are a lot of very general phishing attacks at the moment for, against the banks. Uh, the bank, banks are actually starting to, to get a lot better at um, um, putting controls in to stop these things from from uh, from having a major impact. But um, the uh, interesting ones for LSE, at least, are the phishing emails that we get. Um, these, here are a couple of um, of ones that have uh, come up recently. Um, people still fall for these things. Um, in fact, we had one um, last year, I think, that, that actually made out that it came from an Irish caravan park. I'm not sure um, how people thought this was a legitimate mail, but um, we still had people falling for it, and their accounts were used to send out vast amounts of additional spam. Um, so, a uh, simple thing, don't ever give your password to anyone. Um, you know, um, don't, I often get emails from, from, uh, from Lloyds, and I don't bank with Lloyds. You know, it's all quite obvious that, that, you know, that this isn't, I don't have a bank account somewhere with, with secretly loads of money that I can get access to, sadly. Um, and a little uh, public service announcement for LSE, we actually use message labs for filtering um, spam and phishing emails, and if anyone actually receives one of these things, they can forward the complete message to spam sample at message labs UK. Um, so, um, I missed a slide. There was one about uh, downloading illegal content. Um, uh, we, we do have a lot of students and there, are, there is a temptation to um, access material which, which you would normally have to pay for. Um, it's uh, generally not a good idea. Um, you know, if, again, if it, if it sounds too good to be true, it generally is and you, know, you can get into trouble. So, um, simple measures. Don't use the same password for everything. I, I won't go through this because it's actually all incorporated in our in our um, uh, leaflets, um, which will be made available on our on the IT services website um, quite shortly. Um, yes, conditions of use. There, there's some simple things here to uh, to to um, help you. Um, there are some things that IT services within LSE actually provide as well. Free antivirus. Um, we have a laptop surgery that will disinfect your machine. Um, the one thing about antivirus as well, um, if you use a Mac, still install antivirus because um, while you might not think that it's particularly vulnerable, I've seen now three or four infected Macs um, here and uh, um, with Trojans and, and, uh, and other stuff. Um, and um, the software that we actually provide as an antivirus product through LSE is, it does have a Mac version. Um, so resources, we have our... Um, leaflets that we're giving away. Um, 
there's a list of websites um, which I can make available to anyone who wants them. The simple thing is this. Um, the TUC site, um, ISAF, Get Safe Online, Action Fraud, um, and, uh, and this will be available, I think it's already available on the website. So, there you go, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, any questions for Stefan? Thank you very much. Um, this beggar's belief that you can fraudulently open a bank account in somebody else's name and then defraud the bank and the person who's counted in the money. Surely, if somebody requests opening a bank account, they might provide the ID and, 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 the, bank, and the utility bill or whatever is required, but surely, surely, the bank just needs to say, okay, and then phone back the person who's supposed to be and say, did you ask to open the bank account? But they don't know who you are, so if, if, if you're... Well, then don't open it if you don't know who no, you no, are. No, 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 what I mean is the bank doesn't... If, for example, if I bank with Barclays yes. and somebody goes to Lloyd's and provides my um, um, address and details but provides a mobile phone number or a fixed line somewhere else, yes. then I'll never know. Because all, they, all you need is a utility bill that you can fake, an ID that you can steal, and a mother's maiden name you can make up. So um, you know it's not it's not that difficult, and no. if and if you don't have a pre-existing relationship, the bank won't know who you are. Okay, in that case, it should be made difficult. Yes, <laughs> I agree. And it's not a difficult thing to make it difficult. Just well, send somebody around to the person's house. I I, I don't work in a bank. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to be a major cause of, uh, of fraud. Yes. It should be made difficult to open a bank account. I I I Thank you. don't disagree. <laughs> Well, I have a question whilst you're thinking about it. Um, it's probably a question I'd like you both to answer. Um, Steve, you talked about uh, the government's role and responsibility, and we've also talked about personal responsibility. But what do you think about the responsibility of developers, people like Foursquare and Facebook? What kind of role do you think they play <coughs> in this? Well, OK, um, I... I it's very difficult to blame people who provide a service that people voluntarily join. Um, I think one of the comments I made, um, I think it was day four yesterday, was the decreasing value that people put on their own privacy and the misunderstanding of what an aggregated view of, of what they actually put out on the internet can actually lead to. One of the things that I, I found particularly interesting in, in recent times was a website called pleaserobme.com, which aggregated um, your current physical location with your address. And if your address, uh, your, your home address, if your home address was not the same as your current physical location, it would highlight it saying they're not home. Um, and allow people to, uh, to go around to your house and, and steal everything that you own. And there was a gang, I think, that was caught in the States recently that actually did this. They actually went on Foursquare and Facebook, found the geolocation information, tallied that up with the person's address. They didn't even have to live anywhere near the person who, who, um, who was being targeted. Um, so I think, I think while fate, I think, we can, I think there's a, there is a responsibility for people to make it by default, not as open as they currently make it. I think that everyone still has a personal responsibility to ensure that they know what the impact is of what information they're putting out. I think I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, I, I think everybody has, has responsibility as individuals and as companies as well. Um, I, th I think, to be fair, uh, if it's not something I often want to do, but a lot of these businesses um, are, are learning as well as individuals are learning as well. Um, you, you, know, you probably know that with uh, with Google, the, the not open the company is do no evil, and yet uh, you've probably seen also the reports in uh, many countries about the privacy invasion that um, the, the Street View service uh, was, was doing. So I don't think necessarily that, these, that the people running these organisations are going out to invade privacy. You know, they do have privacy policies. I think they they are often quite naive when they, they start off, but they are also there to, to make money. And often they will think, oh, this is obviously a very good service, you know, it's something that would be commercially valuable, but actually people want to do it as well. And I think it's only 
when it becomes popular, and it becomes popular with the criminals as well as the users, that uh, it then dawns on them that actually maybe this wasn't quite such a good idea for, for uh, their users as, as they thought it was. But the whole threat landscape is, is evolving very rapidly. Um, you know, over the years, Microsoft has had enormous brickbats thrown at it because of the insecurity of, of, of its software. But you look at the development times of, of the software, when they started developing it, you know, several years before it's then released, the, the, the whole threat environment is actually very different. Uh, and they do what they can uh, to fix it as, as new products come out. But actually, you know, there's still a lot of people using uh, Windows 95 and Windows 98 on the internet as well. Um, and they were just developed in an environment where nobody thought that any of this stuff was going, was going to happen. So I think we're all learning, but we've all got a responsibility to, to learn those lessons and to, to improve things accordingly. We've got another question. Uh, sorry, um, at the back, first of all. Um, can I get so far more if we go a couple of years, and given most of the threats we talked about tonight, Oh, that new. Um, what other methods do you think we could use to push awareness further? It's currently getting, and should that be something like it being added to citizenship, it, um, learning at schools, or so that kids, when they start to use a computer, know how they should behave when using the computer. Uh, yes, I mean that, that, that's certainly something that uh, we, we want to pursue over the, uh, the coming years or so, is, is trying to build this much more into uh, the educational process so that people do learn as they, as they learn to use computers, they learn how to use them safely, absolutely. I think it's going, it's, it's going to be difficult, I mean there, there are, um, there's only so far you can go with, with awareness raising. I mean, you need to do it, but I think we need to recognise that it's, uh, it's, it's not going to be 100% successful. Um, you know, the, uh, the, there's one, one born every minute, uh, but also I think it's getting harder and harder for people to recognise when they're, they're being scammed as well. Um, Stefan spoke about some of the, the, the phishing emails and a lot of the ones that you see are you, you sort of think well you know how would you possibly fall for that but then you get other ones that purport to come from uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs and it says you are um, well, we've determined that you're uh, eligible for, for a tax rebate you know click on this link and, and we will pay the money in. now you'd have to be enormously paranoid not, not to do that and I would encourage you to be enormously paranoid because the HMRC does not send out emails like that. <laughs> but uh, when, you know, the criminals are very good at the, the psychology and they are much more agile than the large organisations are. Um, and, and they will find ways of uh, getting people to, to, to take that jump and, and click, on, click on the link. You see that whenever there's a natural disaster, there's a flood of emails saying, oh, you know, we the latest thing about the tsunami or the, or the earthquake or something. Uh, clearly, you know, no, no moral sense, but then you wouldn't expect criminals to so have that. But they, you know, they are very good at understanding human weaknesses and system weaknesses and so on. And that's why, we, collectively, we've all got to just work much harder to uh, make it more hostile for them. I can't just also... To answer that, one of the things that I um, um, have, have been going on about a little bit is, um, is about um, feedback and, and the way that, that um, IT generally works is that we, we try and protect our users as much as possible from knowing what's actually going on underneath the hood. So we don't provide any feedback to them to have any clue what sort of risk environment they're actually, threat environment they're actually working in. Um, and you know, um, we as human beings, we we take risks every day, but they're always calculated and nearly always subconscious. So if you, when you walk across the road, you don't walk in front of the bus. We hope not to. You know, if you're driving down the motorway, you can see someone else having, a, um, you know, um, swerving to avoid something, and you you learn from that, and you 
you, you know, you, you, you take that on board. So you don't actually have to have an accident in order to improve your driving, for example. But in IT, you don't know if your neighbour's been hacked. You don't know if someone's been trying to get into your account. You don't know um, any of this um, that's going on. And, and a lot of the time, even port scanning, for example, now, firewalls just don't, don't tell people because you know, the perception is it happens all the time. And yet it might actually be an indicator that something else is going on. And so I think that by, by trying to make it as simple as possible, we've kind of removed the cues to allow people to make those judgments subconsciously as they would do in the rest of their lives. I think, um, so if I may, just, just another thing which actually is going to make the problem more difficult over the coming years. Um, I came across a statistic a, a little while ago that said that about three years ago, uh, if you averaged it over the whole population, mm -hmm. Global population, we had an average of a tenth of an IP address each, if you like, in terms of devices. Now, clearly, you know, there's a big um, un unevenness about who has a device and who hasn't. I think today it's it's about one. You know, there are uh, six billion or so devices connected to the internet. In three years' time, uh, the estimate is there will be about 14 devices per person. And clearly, you know, some people won't have any. Some will have many, many. We've already seen um, televisions that have full operating systems and internet connectivity in them. People will not be thinking of these things as computers that need patching or need security protection or, or, or whatever. And, and it's going to be even harder, I think, to get people to understand what is going on. And in fact, you know, perhaps it's actually unreasonable to expect people to think that they need to patch their television or put an antivirus on their coffee coffee cup. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just not, um, doesn't sound a reasonable thing to do. And yet we're going to be in that environment where the, the computing device is just so ubiquitous that actually uh, you've got these potential invasions of privacy or you know, t telling burglars when you're out of the house or something, they're just going to be surrounding us. And it's going to be a big issue that, that again, collectively the, the uh, industry and the government and others need to, need to address. If you've got time, I think we could take two more quick questions. Um, the woman at the front and then the gentleman over there. Mark Zuckerberg believes that we only need one online identity. Eric Schmidt says, no, we should have multiple. Who's right? Personally, I think you should have multiple identities because I think, uh, uh, for example, I'm, I'm here tonight as a, as a civil servant. If I go home, I don't want to be a civil servant. I don't. I don't want that same same identity. Uh, so I've been an individual. I've been you know, dealing with my bank. I might be dealing with a local pub. Um, I, I think I have a, a right, if you like, to multiple identities as long as I'm not using them fraudulently. Uh, I think it's a, a, a reasonable security um, measure for myself to have multiple identities as well, and I would say do that. I, I'd agree, but I, I, Eric Schmidt also said that, that uh, you should have a right when you turn 18 to erase everything that you've done previously, which I thought was, was a little bit um, well, difficult for me to sort of um, 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 accept. Um, I think that there is a, um, I think you're right, I think you need to sort of compartmentalise your life in order to stop, um, um, you know, or to, to prevent, limit the risks, that, that the threats from, from jumping one from one to the other. But, um, I think that there is a, um, a role for making people aware of what they're actually doing, because in each of those identities you can still slip up. And so you, I think it's really still very important to be careful about what it is you're doing with each one of those. Just want to ask about mobile phones. Um, using something like, well, specifically a BlackBerry online, is that any more secure, any less secure than um, getting online any other way? It, it's, get, it's getting to the stage where it's, uh, I, I believe, at least as bad. Um, the, uh, there, is, there isn't yet the same security built into the device as you would have a, on a PC. It doesn't have the processing power, if you like, to do some of the things that a PC would do. Um, you don't necessarily have the opportunity of logging in as, dif as different people. Um, a lot of the models now, you're, you're download, downloading applications, you have very little idea of the provenance of those applications. Um, we've heard uh, stories of, of some of the applications, for example, 
um, will make premium phone calls without uh, without telling you. You know, there, there are plenty of opportunities for um, a lot of problems on, on mobile devices. But again, you know, the manufacturers are, are, are learning. Uh, things will improve. Uh, the question I think is whether they will get worse before they get better. I think there's actually I think there's a distinction to build on that. I think there's a distinction between the security of the device and the information that's um, um, that's on it. Um, and I think that uh, um, clearly you can still post something daft on Facebook from a BlackBerry just in the same way that you can from a laptop. Um, but the, but the devices are getting more sophisticated and um, and um, there are threats specific. <laughs> Threats, <laughs> sorry, that, uh, that that may actually impact you in other ways um, than, than you may expect. But yeah, I mean, there, there have been the premium rate phone calls. There, there have always been. What's interesting is there's always been these sorts of scams. Um, there was PVX fraud before. Um, 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 you know, there was the opportunity to use uh, mobiles, and that was the idea that you hack into a company's phone system, you set up a premium rate number in a different country, and you on a Friday night, you phone it up and let it rack up vast bills over a weekend. Um, this is just a variation on the same sort of thing. I mean, um, um, when dial-up modems were in existence, it was the same thing with that, that you could download a, da a dialer and it would automatically dial a premium rate number. It's just, it's the same thing manifested in a different way. So, so there's very little new crime, but mm. there's potentially a lot, a lot more of it. And I think one of, one of the issues with the smart, smartphones is that they are becoming so essential because you're carrying them around all the time. Um, it, you know, they know where you are because they've got GPS, they've got a camera in them, so they're taking pictures of you and your friends. It's got your contact list in, in them. Uh, it may have your calendar in it. You know, everything, really your whole life is often just carried around in your pocket. And therefore, that concentration of information is more valuable. And therefore, it's more of a target and more of a, an impact if it goes wrong. Thank you. Okay, well, um, please, if you would all join me in thanking Stefan and Dr. Steve Mark.